All right. Well, I'm going to pray uh, to get us started today, and then I will introduce the panelists and we'll go ahead and get started. We're really thankful for the opportunity to have this third uh, roundtable of the third season. And uh, we have one more in this season that'll be in April. I'll give a little bit more detail about that as we finish up today a little later. Um, but we're excited about the topic today, is risk worth it? And we want to give a little bit of attention to uh, the idea of danger and risk um, and what that means for <clears throat> those who take the gospel uh, to the nations as Christ commanded us to do. So we're excited about this topic, excited about the four panelists that will be helping us uh, think about this topic scripturally and also from their own experience and on some practical ways as well. So we're going to pray. I'll introduce the panelists briefly, and then we'll go ahead and get started with the topic for today. So let's pray together. Father, thank you very much for this uh, means that you've given us to meet together and discuss the Great Commission, discuss the privilege you've given to us as your people, as your children, and as the disciples of Christ uh, to carry out that commission. And Lord, we thank you for the topic of today. We thank you for the panelists that you have uh, brought to us to uh, discuss this topic amongst themselves and share with us from your word and from their own experience on this topic of risk and danger, facing danger for the gospel's sake. So help us today uh, guide our thoughts, guide the words of the panelists, and Lord, work in us and stir in us all. Uh, a deeper burden to reach people with the gospel and use this session to give direction to each one of us uh, regarding our own role, our own part in making Christ known uh, among the nations of the world. And Lord, stir in us and teach us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, our four panelists today, we'll start with David. Uh, David is not really his name, um, but he uh, serves now in a restricted access nation, a predominantly Muslim context, served previously in Cameroon, and now I was in a different country, and I'm really thankful for uh, David and his willingness to share with us today. So thank you for being a panelist today, David. Uh, second, uh, Forrest McPhail. Uh, Forrest is a missionary in Cambodia, has been there for uh, over 20 years, um, and uh, served there in, in various church planting endeavors, helping in a variety of churches in a variety of different ways. Um, also serves as GFA's regional director for Asia, Australia, and Oceania. Um, so we're glad for Forrest for his willingness to share with us today as well. Thank you very glad much. Glad to be here. Thank you. Grace. Uh, Grace as well is a, a different name than her real name. Uh, she also spent some time in Cameroon ministering. And then the Lord took her to a restricted access nation as well in the Middle East, uh, where she's been serving for a good number of years now as well. So Grace, thank you for your willingness uh, to share with us as well. It's and finally, Todd. Uh, Todd Beeman is a missionary church planter uh, in Zambia, uh, where he has served for uh, over 20 years as well. Am I right? How many years exactly? 16. Okay. All right. I was a little off. Uh, very good. Well, thank you for your willingness to share with us as well, Todd. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so here's the title today. Again, as you know, is risk worth it? And may the Lord help us today as we've already prayed. I answer that question both scripturally and practically. And I'll start with just an English definition from dictionary.com. Uh, what is risk? Uh, risk is the exposure to the chance of injury or loss, a hazard or a dangerous choice. Okay, maybe I'll read that again. Uh, risk is the exposure to the chance of injury or loss. Uh, a hazard or a dangerous choice. So that's a dictionary definition, uh, but I think a lot of times it does help us uh, maybe kind of put that into everyday terms. So uh, I'm going to ask Forrest and then Grace 
uh, to just kind of give us uh, kind of a, a, a working, uh, an everyday definition. Uh, how would they, uh, how would they define risk? And Forrest, we'll start with you. Okay, well, as it re relates to the spread of the gospel, we take risk when we choose to do something that will very likely cost us hardship or great difficulty. We take a risk because the reward for the action that we're about to take is greater than any loss or hardship that might be endured in the process of doing it. So we're talking about temporary risk, of course, because from an eternal perspective, any risk we take for the gospel is always an eternal gain. Amen. Very good. Very good. Grace, how about you? What would you add to that? How would you define risk? I would say that risk is some degree, some degree of possibility that something we value will be damaged or lost. And uh, it's knowingly putting something at stake for the sake of doing or gaining or accomplishing something else. Okay, thank you. I, it was really helpful to me as I interacted with the panelists and, and um, asked them some of these questions ahead of time to try to prepare this session. I thought it was really interesting that both Grace and Forrest included the idea of an exchange. Uh, and they said something like this. Uh, one of them said that, that we're putting something at stake for the sake of accomplishing something else. Um, and uh, Forrest used the word reward. Okay, so there, we're, 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 we're entering danger. We're facing risk. We're facing difficulty. But there is a reward involved. There's an exchange involved. That's the great. That's the word that Grace used. We're 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 putting something at stake for the sake of accomplishing something else. Um, so I'll I'll just I'll ask Todd now. When a missionary takes risks in ministry, when a missionary faces danger in his or her ministry, what is the reward? What is the missionary seeking? in exchange for that risk, in exchange for facing that danger? Okay, so risk for the gospel's sake means that not only you yourself are going, but you're actually, if you have family like I do, you're taking your family into harm's way for the sake of the gospel. And the, the exchange is that you are able to share the good news with people that otherwise would never hear it. And so that's that's the exchange and that's the reward and that's why it's worth it. Okay, that's great. And Todd, I'm I'm wondering, well, maybe you could just say that you you could repeat that and and you know I'm I'm I just really really I think this is so important. This is so important, really foundational uh, for this topic. That this is an exchange. Okay, we're not facing risk just because we like adventure. Okay, <laughs> we're not facing danger. Uh, because we get some personal thrill out of it. There is an exchange. We're doing this. We're putting something at stake for the sake of gaining something else. So, so Todd, I'm wondering if you could just, if you could maybe repeat that, put it in other words, sure. just really emphasize that for us. What are we doing Perfect. here when we face? Yeah. So you, you are weighing, uh, you know, whatever you have prepared for in your life and uh, you want to do, you know, I studied for the ministry. I did that alone. When I was called to come to Zambia, then I had to look at my wife and my four kids and say, okay, uh, now it's really game on. And it, it's, it, it's that much harder uh, because, again, you are, you're not just standing for yourself. You're, you're taking your family there. But, again, when you see those faces, and you start to see people accept Christ their Savior and see their lives transformed, then it's it's worth it. And I, I asked my kids that question last last week, and they all said that it's worth it. We do it again. Amen. Wow, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So so Todd says, here's people that that otherwise would not hear the gospel. They would remain in darkness forever. Um, unless someone is willing to make this exchange, unless someone is willing to put something at stake um, in order to have, in order to gain this, this opportunity to give the light of the gospel to people who are in darkness. So that's the exchange. That's, that's the, that's the reward, uh, this opportunity 
to share the truth of Christ with people who otherwise would never hear. So that that's so helpful. That's so foundational um, for for this topic and answering this question: Is risk worth it? So now we're gonna we're gonna move on and try to give a a quick survey um, of some types of risk, types of danger that exist for the missionary. I think this is also really helpful because a lot of times we get in our own minds, we kind of have one or two things that are dangers that we face that uh, that we kind of have in our minds, uh, maybe because of our own background and people that we've been exposed to or things that we've experienced. But I, it's really, really remarkable when you really dig down, you really drill down. Uh, there are a lot of different risks, a lot of different dangers that missionaries face as they seek to take the gospel around the world. So uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to, I'm going to open this up and just really let any of you share and just give a little bit, a little word of explanation, a little word of application about the the many and various dangers that missionaries face. So who wants to start among the four panelists? I can start. Um, I believe most of the time we think of this risk as being physical and uh, fearing for our lives or maybe our health in certain parts of uh, the world, but uh, it's also financial or uh, property can be at risk, personal property. Um, there's also reputation that is at risk, uh, like in a, a local area and like what scripture has uh explain to us Luke 22 at uh, 622 chapter 6 uh, says that blessed blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the son of man and uh, that is what we're we're dealing with go out in his name for the sake of the son of man and it, it is uh, it could be that reputation uh, for following Christ uh, for us and especially for our believers would be at stake. And then 1 Corinthians 4.13 also talks about being slandered, um, that we have become the scum of the world, the dregs of all things. And um, that is reputation. There's also deportation from some countries, and um, that always comes with other losses along the way, but that's nothing. Our deportation is nothing uh, compared to the what faithful nationals would go through uh, in standing up and following the Lord. And then as been as has been said already, especially by Todd, um, just family is another area. We're taking them into uh, the same situations that we're in and very glad uh very glad that they are are here as a support and um the lord uses them in in key ways so there's a few right physical uh financial uh the risk of deportation um family uh issues risky risk risk for the family and then this idea of reputation that um losing reputation Thank you, David. That's that's good. Anybody else? Who's next? Thinking what, off what, from what, what brother uh, what brother David mentioned on the property issue, uh, just uh, one one issue that can be big and and most in many countries that are not quite as um, financially uh, prosperous as the U.S. is is the the theft theft of your personal property can be a pretty big issue. Uh, this was a big one for the, the team I was serving with when we were in Africa, and we had some co-workers there, some of, some of those on the team that I think were some of the most gracious and patient people that I have ever known in my lives, but they just got robbed over and over again, and I think the, the bad guys just kind of learned that they can kind of get away with it at that house, so um, they faced that over and over again, had some other co-workers that I believe were actually accosted in their home, um, our, our, our home, I was staying there with a, a single uh uh, a, a short termer there actually got broken into too, but in my case it wasn't really suffering because they just 
they took the printer that didn't work very well anyway. So I was actually kind of happy about it. <laughs> but uh, that is a that is a pretty big issue. Right where I am right now, because of the economic crisis we're in, the car theft has become a pretty big issue. So I have a car that that I've named Lima the Lemon. And I'm kind of actually kind of thought about leaving the car, the key in the ignition. <laughs> uh, very good. Okay, thank you. What else? What other risks and dangers do missionaries face for the gospel's sake? Well, I can continue. Um, there's so many possibilities uh, when it comes to risk. So many different categories. Some people plan to go to the field and spend all kinds of time learning about their field, maybe even learning some of the language, race support, and then they can never even get into the field that they had intended on going to or just after getting there, not being able to stay there very long. And that's very devastating. So you don't know for sure you're even going to get to the place that you're intending to go and pouring yourself into. Um, of course, the Lord's plan is much bigger than ours, but that's still a very devastating thing. Uh, we can face trials and testings and temptations in a more intense way than we've ever experienced in, in before, um, such as something like isolation, um, coming from uh, a situation, in, let's say, in the States where you have really good support in your local church and you have, know all kinds of Christians and there's just so much around you to bolster you. Then you get to the field and you're in the middle of nowhere and you're all by yourself. And um, if there are no churches to work with yet and virtually no believers or no believers, then you're in real isolation. And that can be pretty intense. It's a, it's a serious trial. You don't know the language. You can't speak well yet. It really works your soul, really works your emotions. These are very real things. Uh, illness is a really big issue here in Cambodia. Uh, God has raised up a number of cam uh, missionaries to come here over the last couple of decades as the country opened up. And the level of illness, the percentage of missionaries where a family is where one of the spouses is severely debilitated by illness is just amazing. Um, it's, it's a real serious issue. It's a big risk. And people that come here know you know, that if you come to Cambodia, you're basically signing up for illness and suffering uh, in these categories. And of course, that affects your family life, that affects your marriage, it affects your kids, it affects ministry. Uh, when you deal with, with all of these, these issues. Uh, there's direct persecution, like shunning and verbal and physical things. Um, there's subjecting yourself to oppressive regimes. Um, some of our missionaries serve in places where they have to put up with the most severe restrictions on their daily lives. Very severe. Uh, my heart goes out to them. I wonder, you know, I, I naturally, there's no way that I could endure what they're what they're enduring or have endured with those kind of limitations from those oppressive regimes outside of the grace of God. And uh, corruption. You say, well, America is corrupt too. Uh, yes, indeed, it is. Every country is corrupt, you know, uh, but at least maybe we understand that corruption and how to work the system. And then there's the risk of going to another culture where there's severe corruption far greater maybe than in the U.S. and in ways you've never experienced before. And there's a lot of risk of loss there financially and a lot of doubt and fear of what people are going to do to you, being afraid of the police, being afraid of the military not feeling safe when you see the authorities, but wanting to hide from them instead. Um, I remember the first time we came to, I came to the States for my sister's wedding and I was in the O'Hare airport and I was waiting for my ride and a police officer walked up and I thought to myself, this is weird. Uh, I, I'm okay with seeing him. I don't feel like I need to run from him, look the other way, avoid him. I can actually look the man in the face and be glad he's there. Um, risks being stranded in time of war you know we've got missionaries serving in taiwan and we're talking with them you know what happens you know when the country the big brother next door finally finally makes his move what are you gonna do you know you could be uh, a captive you know by them what's your plan of action you know there's real risk there um when we 
face culture shock and we, we go through all the different things that you deal with on the field, uh, you, we're pushed to our limit. Uh, we're pushed to our limit in multiple categories and some, sometimes all at once. And that that is very difficult to handle. Uh, I was talking to a missionary the other day about uh, the, the just sheer weight of the spiritual darkness that she was feeling. And it was so intense to her. And she was so overwhelmed by that spiritual darkness that she was dealing with. Mm -hmm. There's also vulnerability in ministry as well. Okay, I'll be done with this one. <laughs> There's vulnerability in, in, in uh, ministry. Um, you put yourself out there. You, you, if you're involved in church planting and you go out to a place where you're trying to establish a, a ministry and um, the risk is nothing's going to happen or people aren't going to come to Christ for a long time or no one's going to listen or, or uh, be interested. What am I going to do then? And if things are really slow, how you have to handle that over the it was two and a half years for us before we saw anyone interested in the gospel here in Posat City. That's a long time when you're putting yourself out every day for the gospel and uh, the toll that takes on you uh, of, you know, God's people are supporting you to be here and I'm preaching Christ and, you know, I'm, I'm not seeing anything happen. And you really get worked on, worked over by God's spirit and by different uh trials of your own soul so these are all things that are potential possible and probable that are going to hit or could hit you um as you go into cross-cultural ministry well well todd anything to add to that or grace or david anything else to follow up on here with this idea of the types of risk sure uh you know i would definitely echo a lot of what Forrest has said uh, he's put things very well. Uh, for us, I think health has been the biggest issue here in Zambia. Um, and again, to reiterate, as as the dad or the husband, when I have a health issue, I just deal with it. But when your child has a health issue and there's nothing you can do, or your wife has a health issue, uh, it's overwhelming. And certainly that's when you put your trust and reliance on the Lord. Uh, I'll give a, a, a story. My wife was having what she thought was a heart, maybe a heart attack, a heart issue. And so she's like, I, I think we should just go to the, the clinic here. And I said, Kathy, you know that these guys, it's not worth our time. It's like, I, where, what else can we do? And I said, okay, let's go. So we went, we go into the doctor's office. And she gives the symptoms of what she feels. She's having a heart attack. Doctor never takes out a stethoscope, never takes her blood pressure, looks at her and says, I believe you have laryngitis. Okay, so those type of things uh, that you deal with when you're seeing your, your child with malaria, 105 degree temperature, uh, those kind of things. So health issues, uh, lack of good medical help here, you know, that's a big deal. Uh, distance away from family. When we first came, you know, our family was very close back in the States, so our, our children leaving their cousins and their friends behind. Uh, you know, that was, that was a hard thing for them to deal with, being in a different culture as well. They couldn't just communicate right away with the kids that are here. And so that takes time to be able to forge any type of friendships. And then now, uh, as Kathy and I are empty nesters, uh, the loneliness of having our kids in the States and having grandkids that side. So, so that plays, uh, you know, into it. Um, fear of the unknown, fear of the new. Uh, certainly, you know, I, as a man, I have fears. Uh, seeing my children have fears. My, my daughter went through years and years of night terror. Uh, she come wake me up in the night and say, Daddy, I can't sleep. I'm afraid. Um, you know, but in time, as she matured, she was able to overcome that at, as she trusted in the Lord, you know. Uh, so all those things play into uh, the risk and, and things here in, in Zambia. Wow, that's, that's so good. I, I didn't count, but I'm thinking probably 12 to 15 distinct things that the four of you mentioned 
And I just, I just, I do. I want to go back to this. Some, one of you remind us what, what are we doing this in exchange for? What's the reward for facing all these things? Somebody, one of you say it. Can I, can I just yeah. add, yeah. you know, here with uh, medical issues for medical, you know, this has been a great opportunity for medical missions. We have two medical missions from GFA coming this year because medicine is needed and help is needed. And so the Lord has used medical to open up the opportunity for better use of, of being able to draw a crowd and share the gospel message. Yep. Very good. Very good. And these are, these and others are facing these risks for this reward, okay? the opportunity to share the gospel with people who otherwise would never have the opportunity to hear it. We need to keep that front and center. Um, that that is the exchange uh, that we that the Lord calls on us to be willing to make. And um, Carver, so, yes, the issue of worship too. Um, Jesus Christ is worth every single one of these things that we go through. Yep. Uh, the value of obedience to Christ and of worshiping Him in this way and showing how high of a value that we place on him Excellent. and the gospel itself is on display mm -hmm. when we willingly do these things, endure these things, not always willingly, right. <laughs> uh, but we continue by the grace of God and our strength and, and we stay focused on this. It's worship. Uh, we will be rewarded for that. God the, sees the righteous and their good works. Mm -hmm. And one of those things he rewards is, is this faithfulness in worship about the Great Commission when we put ourselves at risk. Amen. Good. Good. You said it is a display of the gospel for us. And that, that made me, I just read this morning in my time with the Lord in, in Luke about Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And while I was reading that, um, just, in, just popped into my head, uh, Hebrews 12 that Jesus did this all for the joy that was set before him. Uh, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Um, and I, again, I think what Forrest just said, that we're actually, we are putting on display the gospel um, of what Christ himself has done when we, when we face these risks um, uh, out of a heart of love for Christ to display his value uh, but then also to take the gospel to people who need to hear. That's wonderful. Thank you, Forrest. Good. So uh, as we, Rocker, I, yes, ma'am, please I do. Have one thing? Yes. I, I neglected to mention a couple of these here, but it brought to mind also, I, there is, there is ultimately going into the, some of these countries, there is ultimately a risk of, of, of life. And that is, uh, that is a reality. It just, I uh, heard not too long ago that uh, a, a family that I actually uh, met when I was in language study, a young family, um, parents were about my age, just about uh, four months ago, um, that man was shot in his car. The the uh, one car blocked blocked the access to to wherever they were going, and there were assailants in another car that just uh, shot him dead. And uh, that was that was very dramatic to me, just because of the perfect the the personal knowledge, knowing what this family was coming from. But that man had really emphasized, and uh, I think throughout his ministry, there is a phrase from a couple of Moravian missionaries who actually gave their lives. Uh, that, that the land may receive the reward of his sufferings. And that really stands out to me too, as well as a picture of what Christ did, but the, the beautiful possibility of, of having, having the Lamb of God receive that, that honor and glory as he is um, by God's grace using even, even the blood of the martyrs, as they say, to, to advance his church. That that is that is the ultimate the ultimate prize to be able that to offer that up to the Lamb of God as well. Amen. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, that's all very very good. Thank you so much. Um, I, as as I'm thinking about this this list of risks, these dangers, um, I think most missionaries have probably heard something like this, even from well-meaning, well-intentioned Christians. Uh, why would you go there? 
Um, why and thinking? Why would you? Why would you face these risks? Why would you do that? Um, and um, I, I think we want to remember always that we're that we live our lives by God's word. That we're followers of Christ, um, and He's left His will written for us in the Bible. Um, so I think it's important again is laying this foundation and trying to understand this question: uh, Is risk worth it? Um, what what scriptures, what Bible passages call us to this willingness uh, to face risk, uh, face danger for the gospel's sake? Maybe uh, the four of you could all pick one passage or maybe two and just briefly share from God's word uh, what what Bible passages call Christians to be willing to do this, to face these risks. Who wants to start there? So. Uh, for me, I've, I always think of missions and what I'm doing is as, you know, I, like I am a, a soldier. So I think of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, that says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I also think when you think about risk is that I, I, the biggest risk is not trying, not, not, not going. Uh, and I think of the reward that that comes from going, and one of my favorite verses is from Matthew 19:29. It says, "And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life." Mm-hmm. And so, again, the biggest risk is not trying, not going. Amen. Matthew 19, 29. Good. That's good. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just share one that is a passage that's just dominated my mind in the last maybe five years or so. Second Corinthians chapter four, verses seven through 12 and following, but I'll just read several of those verses. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. We have this treasure in jars of clay, and of course, we are those jars of clay, and our weakness is very obvious to us all, and um, God does not forsake us when we suffer, take risks, and deal with loss and sorrow and difficulties. God is there. He's with us, but this verse 12, I just love this little verse. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Jesus' death brought life. Our death brings life. Every way by which we put self to death for the sake of the gospel brings life and the potential for life to other people. If we're not willing to die to ourselves and there is no life to be born uh, in the lives of other people, it requires death. People have to follow the example of Christ and lay their own selves down. They need to be willing to take a risk and do those things that are hard and costly. Um, embrace suffering if need be um, in order to bring life to other people. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Amen. That's great. Second Corinthians 4, or did you say 7 through 12 was that passage? Yes, Good. especially verse 12. Good. Thank you for us. That's great. Grace or David? I would like to add Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And that I think primarily would reference actually coming to Christ and salvation 
but also the discipleship picture of we follow Jesus Christ wherever he leads. And uh, for it strikes, strikes me that if, if we're called to, to the service, a kind of service of being on the front lines, and don't want to get stuck being a wallflower, because if you don't follow, you're, you're likely to end up with a pretty, pretty dull and, and, and boring life, actually, and opposed to the life of real adventure and challenge that Christ meant for you to have. And so that it follows as a picture of true discipleship. And another one that I love is Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. And it seems to me, talking about the fellowship of his sufferings, that that indicates that there's a certain, a certain area, a certain um, kind of really sweet fellowship that, that with the Lord Jesus Christ that we aren't going to have unless we really have that privilege of being able to actually join in those sufferings that he, he, he bore for, for our sake. And so it, uh, looking at it from a perspective of, you know, this the sweet fellowship, it really is the best part of this life as well as the life to come. And also just looking at it from a perspective of eternity. It seems to me like once we get there, it's it, we're going to feel right now where our temptation is just to to avoid all those things. But once we get there, I think we're if if, if it would be possible, we're going to wish that we had just had more to be able to enjoy that sweet fellowship and, and that proof of our love for him. Wow. Well, that's great. Matthew 16, uh, taking up our cross, and Philippians 3.10, the fellowship of his sufferings. Wonderful. David, anything else to add, another passage or two that you'd like to share? Yes, it's just um, the Apostle Paul uh, really called people to, um, to that risk of suffering. And Timothy, he, he called him, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. He's calling him, join with me. He also had the same attitude toward as he uh, returned to Antioch after his first missionary journey. Um, he, he strengthened and encouraged them in, in what way? to continue in the faith saying through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of god um that is putting the risk out there and the reward as well in in one encouraging word through many tribulations oh, wow. we must enter the kingdom of god let's move forward continue in the faith uh this is worth it um the gospel according to the power of God is worth it. Um, and then Christ himself, that, by the way, those were, I didn't give references there. Um, that was Acts 14, 22, talking to the church at Antioch, calling Timothy to suffer with him was 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8. And um, Christ calls us to, uh, to follow him in this same way, unless this is John 12, 23 to 26. Um, he's talking about his hour has come to be glorified. What is that hour? We know that as giving up his life to be a ransom for our sins. And he said, he, he, it is the same idea that, uh, that, uh, Grace talked about. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, that risk involved, not just physical, but it's if you die to, die to self, what will happen to that one grain of wheat? If it doesn't die, it's just one grain of wheat. It stays alone by itself. But if it dies it brings forth much fruit. He who loves his life, wanting to save it, loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, uh, he must follow me. That's the risk. Where I am, there my servant will be also. We'll follow him into risk. 
into any kind of suffering. It's okay, because if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. The reward comes afterwards. It is worth it. Amen. Wow, that's great. Great. And I know we could spend hours looking at <clears throat> many more passages that call on followers of Christ to have this willingness uh, to face risk, to enter danger for the gospel's sake. Um, but I think those passages probably raise another question. Um, is, 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 it, is it ever okay uh, to avoid danger? Um, I think that's another question that's probably naturally raised as we hear all these passages, these commands about uh, taking up our cross and following Christ and entering the kingdom of God through tribulation and and this willingness to suffer for Christ, which we should all have, um, I think maybe the question that would come up would be, is it ever okay uh, to actually get ourselves out of a situation of danger? Is it ever okay to avoid risk? Um, so would one of you want to speak to that question? Does, does the Bible ever allow us to get around uh, danger in any instance? I believe... Uh... We are uh, given wisdom, but also from God's word, just to, if risk is perceived to threaten the long-term effectiveness or will of God, or keeping that door open longer, um, or just finishing the work, keeping this present work that's going on intact um, so, it, so that it can continue. It's a future, future look. Um, and this is maybe hinted at in Mark 1, uh, Jesus heals the leprous man, and then he says he sternly warned him not to tell uh, of himself. Uh, the man, of course, was very excited and didn't do that. He went, went ahead and told and uh, of Jesus and who he was to the extent where he um, he went out and began to proclaim, proclaim freely and spread the word, the news around, to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in the unpopulated areas, uh, and they were coming to him from there. But it can cut off ministry. Okay, yeah, good. Anything to add to that? Does the Bible allow us sometimes, in certain instances, to avoid danger and uh, why would we why would we do that? How do you know when to do one and when to do the other? Anything else? Some observ there? Yeah, for observations us. here that I made just reflecting on the book of Acts. At times, Paul's avo Paul avoided risk when it was too great, like in Acts 13 and 14, while at other times he knowingly walked right into it, like at Lystra and Jerusalem. It seems he made each decision based on God's guidance through circumstances visions which sometimes was through other believers telling him what to do sometimes he listened to them and sometimes he didn't listen to them uh, we see that peter and james boldly preached in the temple with with complete boldness for a time even under immediate threat of physical harm and possible death and at that time james was put to death and peter was not so this seems to be a, a wide range of of responses uh, in the book of acts to what to do how to respond, whether or not to uh, run or hide versus uh, stay at it. Stay at it, David. You you mentioned David. You mentioned a, th a, a just a point or two about um, why there would be some occasions where the wisest thing might be to avoid to avoid danger. Um, would you Would you maybe touch on those again? Like when when would it maybe be best sometimes? Uh, to avoid the risk instead of going through it. Yeah, if it would if it would mean maybe exposure to a, let's say you're in a regime where uh, if you are too much exposed, then your whole ministry would be cut off. Let's say that your people would be um, could be imprisoned. Uh, you could be uh, deported, um, and that that could fall in the will of God. Uh, that could be to the, uh, we see in Acts that that kind of persecution did scatter the gospel. Um, that could be used of God, but 
to keep things intact um, sometimes for some uh, decisions, you know, whether to do evangelism this way or this way, whether to meet in this place or meet in several places. Uh, it, uh, it can be avoiding a, a public nature and being cut off that way. Good. Yeah, that's helpful. Good. Good. Well, in, in a little bit later in the Q and a time during the last minutes we have together, I want to return to a question about, um, how to, how to prepare, how to really some practical ways that we could be, that somebody could be ready and know how to make these decisions about whether to go through the risk, um, or avoid the risk, uh, really preparing ahead of time. Um, but I think it, it would probably be helpful to hear, uh, at this point, maybe, a, maybe a few illustrations uh, of, of people either maybe from your own personal experience, just personal illustration, or maybe from church history, from the expansion of the gospel in the last 2000 years of how the Lord has used, uh, this danger missionaries who have been willing to face risk, uh, to expand the gospel. So maybe, maybe a couple of you could, uh, share an illustration from the past, some story of gospel expansion because of risk, because of danger. Who wants to share something personal or from church history? Uh, I'd like to share something about this. Um, you know, this is something I spend a lot of time thinking through scenarios that could take place, uh, risk, dangers that could come up, and how I would deal with that. I also spend time talking to other missionaries, listening to their stories when they've been confronted with the same type of risk and seeing how they dealt with those things. I think you have to think ahead of time and be prepared for, uh, for those things when they come up and know exactly what you're going to do. But you also rely on God's grace for those unforeseen things. That happens to me all the time. I can think through all these scenarios, but I always get blindsided by something that I've never even thought about before. And so that, that's when we just rely on the Lord's grace. I spent a lot of time, uh, again, reading missionary biographies. And, you know, I, I, they become my friends because I, as I'm reading those stories, I can relate to what they're going through and say, you know, that's probably a good way of dealing with that situation. So if that would ever come up, that's what I would want to do. I've been going through the book of John with my people at TJ Azo. And I see so many times where during the life and ministry of Christ, when the crowds came and they wanted to take Jesus, stone him, kill him, he passed through the crowd. Why? Because it wasn't yet his time. So I can have full assurance that whatever situation I'm facing, that if it's not my time, it's not my time. That's right. and I'm going to be able to deal with that. But if it is my time, then it's my time. <laughs> and I have a hope, the hope of eternal life. And so I have no fear. And that's okay. And so, um, you know, I also think about, you know, the fact that Jesus died for them, so I don't have to. So I really want to try to run when I can run, so I can have the opportunity to share the gospel with these people again. Good, good. Yeah, that's helpful. Good. Any other illustrations, personal or from biographies, which Todd mentioned? Maybe one or two more. I have one, uh, a biography um, about missionary George Bull. He was a British missionary that went to, to China for the purpose of going to Tibet. And he got to China as a single man. And he's there. He studies Chinese, gets it down pretty well in several years, giving it all he's got. And he learned Chinese so he can go to Tibet. So then he crosses China, gets to Tibet, and he starts learning Tibetan. And he gets to the point where he's just crossing the border into Tibet. And that's when Mao's communist regime is taking over China. And they imprison him. And he experiences great physical agony and trials and, and just all kinds of horrible things he faced in prison for a couple of years. He finally gets released. He, he, he's, he's a broken man. He, get, go, he goes out through Hong Kong, goes back to, to England. Uh, never got to do what he set out to do, really, almost at all. But then once he heals, and even before he heals, 
he gets opportunities to preach the gospel everywhere. Everybody wants to hear him preach. He's seeing people get saved all over the place and called to missions through his ministry. Um, that's not what he set out to do. And he had to experience great suffering in order for God to make him ready and capable and to have, have an opportunity to even do that. Wow. That's good. So I just love that story of, of uh, that missionary, George. Great. That's great. That's great. Good. Grace or David, any illustrations that you'd like to share? I can throw in one real quick, just on a personal level, because it may be where where a number of people are at this point, but just getting ready on the initial stages of going to the field. Uh, when I when I started toward this path of heading toward the Middle East, it really was not just a risk on my end, but it was a risk on uh, GFA's end and my, my pastor at home, and in the sense of um, being somewhat insecure because we didn't have people out here that we really knew wasn't, um, it's a little bit, it's on the risky side to send a lady into the Middle East and to try to work through, is this really, is this really God that is doing this, that is bringing this about? And uh, I'm really thankful that my leadership was willing to to really work through those those things and to be willing to take the risk right along with me of of, of facing the possibility that this really is the lord's leading even though it, it was a, a bit on the unusual side and we really didn't know going into it was hard to be sure from a human perspective that there was going to be a good fit for a single lady right right out in the midst of this this territory where we don't really know people and just really thankful as as we've seen seen that as we've moved along and I've got Pastor Keith here is one of my uh, one of my one <laughs> one of my greatest greatest support forces in the background. I'm very thankful for him, but just really thankful for how the the the, uh, the doors the Lord has opened. He's put me in a place where there was actually a tremendous need for the kind of ministry that that the Lord has given me with the ladies that I'm working with to have someone to follow up with them, and got wide open doors right now for the gospel in this time frame where we are right now. And so that to me, just seeing that how God worked in the past, being willing, uh, not just for me, but for my leadership to take that step forward to following um, following the Lord's, the Lord's leading. And he, the, the story is not told yet. We're still kind of in the middle of the story, but it's encouraging, encouragement to me and I hope will be to others as well, just to when the Lord does open those doors to, to be willing to go forward and take those risks. Amen, good. Good. That's great. Thank you. Well, how about one more question? And uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes each here um, to, um, I, you know, we, we usually end these roundtables and I, it's just so, it's always so stirring to me just to, to really give the panelists uh, just an opportunity to give some final words to us on the topic. So here, the question today, is risk worth it? You know, we've heard about all these different kinds of dangers and what the scripture calls on us to be willing to do. Uh, we've heard some stories about the way the Lord has, has used uh, risk and, and danger to spread the gospel. Um, and and I just, maybe just take a, a couple of minutes each um, and maybe just in a really direct way answer that question. What, what makes risk worth it? I mean, how, what does the Lord do in us um, to, to make us willing to, to take opportunities like this, to face risk, to face, to face danger? Okay, what, what is the value? Um, what motivations are there? There's another word. What motivations are there um, for, for taking risks for the sake of the gospel? Um, and... Um, Todd, maybe we could start with you. What's, what's, exhort us, okay? Why should, be, sure. we, should we be willing to do this? All right. Well, first of all, I, I cling to number one is my calling. I have no doubt that it is my calling to be a missionary. <laughs> Sorry. In Zambia, Africa. And so regardless of the risk, regardless of what we face, those difficult challenges, I, I fall back on that. So I know yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. God called me to this place, and he is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. 
he's going to provide for me in those darkest of times. Um, so knowing the short calling, because we get tested all the time. But when we see people that are in a dark, spiritually dark village, dealing with witchcraft and dealing with their provincial life, coming to Christ and seeing life transformed, seeing a village transformed because so many Christians now are living there to see uh, the waning of witchcraft and drunkenness and all of that, to see that lived out makes it worth it. And so, yeah, I would take the risk over again, no problem. And my wife would, and my, my kids would as well. Amen. Wonderful. Thank you. Thinking of the exchange, the reward. That's wonderful. Good. Good. Okay. Who's, who would like to, to answer that question next? What motivations do we have? What makes risk worth it? I would go back to what uh, Brother Todd was saying about, uh, about the calling and uh, there was a passage that struck me in, uh, in Exodus 3 where Moses was talking to the Lord and he was complaining about his insufficiency to do what he was called to do. And we know, of course, that Moses was absolutely right. He was insufficient, but the Lord gave him two, two things. He, he, he said that the two things that, that made it worth it, really worth it to take the risk that he, he himself was sending him and that he would be with him. And those two factors seem to me to be the critical ones that uh, I have myself other ideas that weren't necessarily of the Lord. And I'm really thankful in those cases that I've had, I've had wise counsel to keep me from taking risks that weren't really of the Lord. But when they really are, the, I think that the chief one that really, that really motivates and really totally makes it worth it is love for the captain that we are following, uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ. When, when he speaks, who can, who can say anything when he's given so much for us to just have the privilege of going forward after him? There's nothing, nothing else in life that is more wonderful than that. And I think, it, secondly, as far as the calling goes, as, as Brother Todd mentioned, but just the realization that if you, if you are called to do this, anything else isn't, isn't going to work. It's going to be a Jonah experience. And, and uh, then also one thing that really is really a sweet thing to me, I call it getting, getting in under the hijab, the, the privilege of really getting to know these ladies um, that I'm working with now as as you you see you see often people who are different from us and different religious habits and different different customs and you see them from afar as strangers but when you have the privilege of getting into their own society their own, their own environment and learning them as as a as a beautiful creation of god with with their own particular needs that are not going to be met apart from jesus christ that makes it totally worth it to, to be to have the privilege of serving among them and pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ and and to know that that by God's grace we are going to have interaction for all eternity not only with them but other brothers and sisters that they have also influenced and brought to Jesus Christ along the way so so re returning the the, and, and the joy of then the, just the fruit in their lives of being able to see them who face greater risk than we do. I think Brother David already mentioned that, that they, they face greater risk than we do. But seeing them actually all over, able to overcome their fears and press forward with Christ as well, that makes it totally worth it. Wow. Very good. That's great. Great. I can try to offer a few things after those excellent thoughts. Um, when I was... Um, in college, I had a very intense desire for the Lord to allow me to do something hard for him. And I prayed, Lord, let me do something hard for you. Uh, now, that's kind of an immature prayer request because all obedience to Christ in every circumstance that we could ever be in is, is hard and we need God's grace to do it and we can accomplish nothing apart from him and whatever God wants us to do uh that's what we ought to want to do uh, in service to him but what i had in mind by that was lord put me in a situation that is so hard and so impossible that when you work i can't get the credit for it and that's the desire of my heart 
And then God brought us to Cambodia, and it was a very clear fulfillment of, of that prayer. Because there's no way we we're going to see God do anything. I remember for the first two and a half years here, nothing happening, pouring my heart out in evangelism and talking to people every day, all the time, preaching Christ and not anything. Then finally seeing some people come to Christ and they put away idolatry and worshiping of evil spirits and they start experiencing new life in Christ and their lives are changing and they're facing persecution and they're enduring it for the Lord and they're growing. Wow. I mean, I get to be here and I get to be an instrument of the Lord to, to be a part of this. Who am I? I'm nobody. Uh, I have no power, no ability to see God do that. I get to do this, really. I get to be an ambassador for the Lord. This is a major privilege. Um, you know, this this verse in 2 Corinthians 4.12, so death is at work in us and life in you. Yes, we put ourselves to death. And yes, sometimes it's very hard. But is that it? Is it all we have to do? And then God uses us. And then there are eternal rewards for ourselves. And especially for those that come to Christ. Um, God doesn't waste any of our sacrifices. Uh, God uses all of these things. He doesn't, all, all of his seed, uh, he, none of it is in, in vain. You know, my dad and my brother are both involved in financial planning, investing other people's money. And that's what they do for a living, helping other people put their money in the right places to make it grow, right? Um I'm at that time of life where they start saying, no, do you, should you start getting into lower risk investments now that you're getting old? Uh, you know, I'm pushing, I'm pushing 50. So now I should get into those lower <laughs> risk investments. Um, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have a no risk investment, right? Amen. I mean, it's not really risk. I mean, we have a guaranteed eternal reward for all of these things. Amen. Good. Wow. So it's a win-win all the way around. But in our lack of faith, in the smallness of our minds, we allow whatever our fears are to loom large and squeeze out uh, the possibilities of the ways the Lord might use us if we would just believe his words. Amen. Um, That's great. It is not really a risk in one sense. That's great. And until we understand that, we won't be willing to take <laughs> What is considered risks in order for the to get gain the eternal reward benefit of these things? Great, fantastic, good. Thank you, Forrest. David. Amen. Wow, it's been good for me to uh, hear all of these answers, the motivations. I appreciate that, and I know for me, uh, when discouragement or Really, any kind of temptation comes to uh, lessen the motivation to take risk or any kind of ministry. The verse that continually, or the part of a verse that continually comes back to my mind as the answer for me is in Colossians 3.24, the very end of that verse, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Um, I serve the Lord Christ, and that answers so many uh, doubts or disappointments. Uh, I serve the Lord Christ. So, what if you know we have been ha we've had the privilege of working among Muslim people uh, for several years, and um, the uh, the fruit. At least the outward fruit is uh, rather small. And so I've had people ask why, what is your motivation that, that keeps you going on, you know, where you don't have outward fruit there? And uh, I came across 2 Corinthians chapter 2 that really helped me with that, that uh, 
that question, uh, at that time, the apostle Paul was discouraged, but he said that he, all, in, 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 verse thir- in verse 14, he says, but thanks be to God. You know, even in his discouragement, he said, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. And I remember looking at that verse and going, he used the word always and in every place. And I don't, you know, I don't feel always that way. Uh, Triumph or in every place. I've been to a lot of different villages and haven't had a lot of response outwardly, but the next verse really helps us. Um, We are a fragrance of Christ to God. Um, Among those, so our fragrance, we have Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. For some, it's a savor, a good, sweet smell of life unto life. They're accepting that, and it will be unto eternal life. For others, it's a savor of death. It just does not smell good at all. And for them, they'll reject, and it'll be unto death. But what I focus on, I had the privilege of giving this, and to some, it is eternal life that this gives to them. Not me, but it's the fragrance of Christ given to them. But really what I focus on is we are a fragrance of Christ to God. And so mm-hmm. when he, he receives that as our worship to him, mm-hmm. I give that up. Every time I am giving that fragrance of Christ, I'm giving up that worship to God. He receives it as uh a worship service unto him, and it's a sweet smelling savor to him. So I serve the Lord Christ. That keeps me going. Oh, that's great. Praise the Lord. Good, good. Well, we do need to wrap up here. Um, uh, this first hour, and um, I'll pray in just a moment, and um. Then we'll have a few minutes after I pray um, for some follow-up. I have received a question here through the chat. And of course, if you have something you'd like to follow up on, please send that to me. Uh, maybe a specific danger, a specific risk that you'd like to ask about, um, or really any question related to this topic. Uh, I'd love to, to receive that from you through the Zoom chat, or you could even ask it verbally as well after we're after we pray. But I know some of you may need to, to head out, and that's fine as well. But thank you, Forrest. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, David, for serving us so, so well today, so carefully, uh, biblically, and so warmly. Um, it's just been such a, such a challenge, such an encouragement, uh, very convicting as well uh, to hear your, uh, your answers to these questions. So thank you. Um, for your time and effort to share with us today. Um, I am going to pray, and then if you need to take off, uh, we are grateful for your attendance with us today. Trust it's been a blessing. Trust you'll be able to join us for the next roundtable. It's April 22nd. The title of that roundtable is Joys and Challenges, Joys and Challenges of My Missionary Service. And we'll have some panelists who will give personal testimony to both of those things, both the joys and the challenges uh, of the time that they have spent on the field uh, serving the Lord and carrying out the Great Commission. Uh, Of course, we would really be glad for the chance to serve you in some way. If there's some question we could answer for you or some way we could serve you in the name of Christ for, uh, for his sake as you seek to determine what the Lord has for you, Uh, the way you should be involved in the Great Commission, uh, the next step you uh, should take. Uh, We would really be thankful for the opportunity to uh, talk with you, uh, to get to know you, to try to help you just determine what the Lord would have for you as your next step uh, as you follow Christ. So you could reply to the email you got with the Zoom link for today. That'll go to Dr. Alan Patterson, 
Uh, you could, of course, reach out directly to me. My email is jcrocker at gfamissions.org. And uh, we'd be really thankful for the opportunity to get to know you a little bit and know how best we could we could serve you um, in the cause of Christ. So let's let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time uh, that you've given us. Uh, Lord, thank you for um, the uh, the Savior that you have given to us. Lord, thank you for calling our attention many times today to the greatness of His work for us um, and the privilege. Uh, the remarkable, remarkable privilege that we have um, of calling on others to know him and cherish him and follow him and serve him. Um, and Lord, we, we have heard today from your word. We've heard today uh, practically from these panelists that you've given to us today of the joy of um, facing risk, uh, the joy of suffering, of sharing, uh, and fellowship, uh, the fellowship of his sufferings um, as we serve him. Um, and Lord, I pray that you would stir in us that willingness um, to follow him, to take up a cross and follow him, even unto death. Uh, to display his worth, to display love for him, and to give the message to those who, uh, apart from our own uh, willingness to suffer, would never hear of Christ. Um, and Lord, release us, we pray, from um, making an idol out of safety and security and comfort. I mean, give to us that willingness, Lord. Work in us that willingness uh, to follow Christ wherever he leads, to do whatever he would call on us to do. Um, Lord, thank you for him. I mean, Lord, we pray that you would make our lives pleasing to him in every way. Uh, and we pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, if you need to go, uh, thank you for being with us. I've got a couple uh, questions to follow up as well, uh, but we do have one that's come in, so we'll start with that one. Um, and, of course, if you have a question, you're welcome to send that to me as well. But um, here's, a, here's a question um, touching on something Forrest mentioned, um, and this is, a, this is a good question. On the one hand, uh, the reward is eternal. Okay, so... Uh, in in light of that, uh, the the risk is negligible by comparison. So Forrest said, it's really not a risk. Um, the reward is eternal. Um, we know the outcome of, of gospel ministry. We know the outcome. Um, so in that sense, the risk is negligible. But on the other hand, uh, when faced with a choice, um, the, the natural response might be to go to the field or take the action um, where there's the lowest risk <laughs> because the return is actually essentially the same. Um, so the question is, how do you reconcile those two things? Um, how do you reconcile the fact that uh, the return is technically going to be uh, the same, that the gospel is going to have this effect in every nation? How do you reconcile that um, with this idea of going to the places um, where the risk might actually be lower uh, because we know that the gospel is going to have its effect there as well. I think I'm, I think I'm expressing that question the right way, the way that it came through. Uh, how do you reconcile these two ideas? Um, uh, go place, go to a place where there's low risk because the people there are going to come to Christ or go to a place with high risk because the people are going to come to Christ. Um, so how do you how do you sort through that? I, I hope I'm representing that question correctly. So anybody want to answer that? Anybody want to take that on? Cambodia is a place that is politically a low risk. It's probably the safest place for missionaries to serve in, or one of the easiest one of the easiest places to get into and stay in in in, in Asia. 
um, and here I am in Cambodia. There's a lot of persecution. Uh, there's demonic activity. There's Buddhism. There's lots of physical risk and corruption and stuff like that. But I don't I don't face persecution to violence or anything like that. So that's the context I'm in. I think when we're thinking about places, low risk, high risk, where you should go, where you should serve, most unreached places in the world or a, le a, a more reached place, I think the bottom line is what does God want me to do? To know the will of God and to do it. Uh, that is the emphasis of Christ's life before the Father as a man revealed to us in the Gospel of John over and over again. And the epistles we see Paul keep emphasizing that, emphasizing that as well. What is the will of God for me? What does God want me to do? And of course, God uses our burdens for ministry. He uses um, other people. He uses our circumstances. He uses our local church. He uses our spiritual leadership. He uses all those things to guide and direct. And um, there is not a spiritual meter on people that are going to more risky places or more godly and more righteous and somehow are, are better missionaries than people that go to uh, less risk places. That's, that's not the question, obviously. Um, I hope that somehow helps answer. Yeah, good. Good. That's helpful. Grace, were you going to answer that as well? Yes, if I could just throw throw a few thoughts in there real quick. I amen to that thought about where God wants us. So we we actually had to deal with this when I was headed toward the Middle East. Someone presented that, that question to my pastor. You know, if there so there are plenty of there are plenty of Muslims in in England, and there it's not illegal to go. So why doesn't she just go to England? So so we had to work through that, and I think. Uh, three, I think three, three things that that really stand out, stood out, stand out to me. Number one, like like Brother Forrest was saying, it is it is the Lord of the Harvest who sends his who sends his laborers wherever he wants them. So it's not really actually up to us. And number two, um, that there is a a certain factor. I, I kind of think of it as a as a spring factor, where um, for instance, here in in the Middle East, this is. And probably the same for for a brother Forrest, but this is the center of of where the, these religious thoughts and ideas are springing from. So if you're trying to, uh, you have an obvious factor of the devil who is sowing his sowing his seeds of falsehood all over the world. So if you're going to to uh, if you're going to try to address those issues do you want to go to the spring where they're coming out of or do you want to go to the way out center you know you've got so we've got we've got muslims in england but that's not really where those thoughts are coming from so that's another factor that, that getting right into the midst of it actually there there is a there is a, a second factor there and then uh, finally, that uh, number three, a lot of those those other areas that are safer have a lot of other people who are are going to them. Actually, there there are areas that are that that are more that are considered more challenging, more risky. They don't tend to have as many people there, and so that is that is a, a third factor. I think one of the missionaries that said, "You'd rather see my can." Candle burn my one little candle burn out in a dark place than in a place where there are already so many other candles burning too. Good, good. I'll add one thing there uh, as well. Um, you know, the Christ's explicit command to us as his followers was to make disciples of all nations. I mean, his explicit will, his explicit will is that all peoples know <laughs> that all peoples. Uh, be made disciples, be made his disciples. Um, that's the commission that he gave to us. Um, and so that is going to require that some people <laughs> uh, go to these riskier, more dangerous places um, for, the, for the church to be obedient to Christ. Uh, so we have to send the gospel uh, to those places. Um, and so it really goes back to that, what Forrest and Grace both said, um, it's a matter of determining where the Lord would would best use me in getting the gospel to all peoples. Um, and for some people, that means going to a place where maybe the gospel is already fairly well established, but there 
Uh, the real need is seeing laborers raised up to take the gospel to these riskier places. Um, so a missionary can go, and it's it's actually not a very difficult place to live. Uh, there's a lot of light there already, but uh, that particular land that has a lot of light could be a, a place where more laborers are raised up to go to darker places. Maybe the Lord would use me in that way. Um, and, but, but maybe the Lord would want me in a place that's completely dark and there's a lot of risk, uh, because Christ said to take the gospel to all the nations. So it really is a matter of determining, uh, where best, uh, the Lord, I could be used, um, in, in, in spreading the gospel to all nations. And that's really something that every Christian has to answer, needs to face, uh, and, and answer personally. So that's, that's a thought that I would add as well there. Good. Well, um, I had um, an, another question um, to, to follow up on some of the, the things that were mentioned today. Um, and when we think about danger, when we think about risk, uh, a natural response um, is um, at some level fear. Uh, fear of experiencing some of these dangers, <laughs> uh, fear of the quants the consequences of of going th of going through this and continuing to share the gospel and continue to carry out Christ's commission in that place. Um, so here's a question for the panelists: How do you deal with fear? Because I know uh, that th those that that you all have to. Uh, I know that you all have that temptation. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, how would you answer that question for these, for people that may be considering this risk, considering danger, how do you deal with fear? Who wants to take that? Uh, I'd like to start if I can. Yeah. Thank uh, you. So I would say that whenever these times have come to where you should fear, the Lord is always with me and I don't fear. So it, I, it, afterwards, when you think about it, you say, wow, how did, how did I deal with that? Or, or, you know, how did that scenario go that way? It's just the Lord giving you the grace at the exact time, giving you the words to say so that you can get through that moment. Uh, so that would be my answer every time. I've never been in a situation where fear was gripped me in such a way that I couldn't actually uh, perform. So don't be afraid. Just go for it because the Lord will give you the grace you need. Yeah. Good. Good. Mm -hmm. good. That's great. I would say what's helpful, um, for me is just all of the scripture that, that Christ already knows our weakness that we will fear. And when he sent out his disciples in Matthew 10, that has been a really good passage to go through starting in verse uh, 16 all the way to the end of the chapter he uh, tells them you know you're, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves so we're basically following him as as our shepherd we're the sheep but be wise as serpents be harmless as doves beware of men be ready for persecution that's what the passage goes in but proclaim and it's just yes there there are these factors ahead of you be all of these things but as as my sheep i'm your shepherd i'm leading you in this way and this is my will proclaim what is the next section in that in that uh chapter he just repeats over and over do not fear do not fear um uh him who kills the body but can't is not able to kill the soul and uh just comforting those who are following him and doing his will that that is a true comfort from christ who is like todd says i'm with you always it's great another uh angle on that would be the things that we fear are things that we've idolized in our own hearts you know the range of what makes us afraid from person to person that i'm looking at on the screen here is very a wide range of what those things are. Some people don't want to go into cross-cultural missions because they don't want to be accountable to, to churches. 
There are some people that if you were to re really get down to it, they don't want to have administrative details. They don't want to, they don't want to have to deal with uh, emails to churches and interacting with pastors and making phone calls. The greatest fear is even just communicating to churches about their desire to go to the field. And they would rather not even consider being a missionary rather than make those phone calls and write those, write those emails. Uh, there might even be somebody like that listening to me right now. Uh, our, our fears are so wide and varied. We tend to think of it only in terms of the fear of physical violence or illness or a huge loss. But the things that we allow to become our idols um, differ greatly. I, I even at one time idolized being a church planning missionary here in Cambodia. Uh, and that my, my idol was God, through my health, took away from me the ability to do church planning in a remote area like I was wanting to do. And I had to lay that down and give it to the Lord. And I was afraid of losing that. And I had to give it up, give it to the Lord and let him redirect according to his purposes. Good. And um, good. good. Yeah. Well, we'll do one more question. Um, this is a specific question for people who minister in a restricted in restricted access nation. So here, this would be for for David and Grace specifically. Um, have there been times when you have faced a, a personal confrontation uh, for being a Christian or for sharing the gospel, and how how do you respond to that? Um, and then there's a kind of a related question. Uh, you may want to answer these separately. Um, is it ever appropriate in your contexts um, to, and the, the question has the example of, of Rahab, of, of withholding the truth um, in the way that Rahab did when confronted in, in Jericho about hiding the spies. Um, so uh, just kind of a general question about confrontation. How do you respond to that? And just this issue of how how much do you share um, with with the people? Um, and again, if maybe if you're not comfortable sharing that in this context, that's totally fine as well. So, um, but if you're willing to answer one or or part of that that question, that'd be that'd be great. Anything about confrontation there? As far as um, <clears throat> being confronted, uh, it has never really. I, um other than being stopped in the middle of the message uh being sent out of the village where i was but not really uh at any risk at all to me is it at risk to the people who were not able to hear, hear the message um but I've, I've really not run into anything like that where I was, I was threatened. Um, you know, people will, will get angry, but that happens anywhere in the world, in the States. Um, so the other, uh, part of the question, I think we do need to be wise as serpents. And that is telling people, uh, the truth or presenting ourselves in a truthful way but in a way that would allow us to continue the Lord's work <laughs> and following his authority, even though there are local authorities that might be going against what he wants. But when it comes to coming, to, I, you know, I can be so wise. I do not want to uh, tip over the edge and come to that point where I think what you're talking about in the question is, would it would there be any lies told no that's not harmless as a dove that's not you know following the lord at all um and when it comes to that yes we will we will be truthful but there are other passages uh that really lead us to the point where yeah we can we can tell the the truth all the time but uh do they have to know every bit of truth? <laughs> no. And uh, that would be wisely taking a risk. Good. Good. Thank you. Well, it is 1030 here. Um, I'm going to finish up when as we dismiss today with sharing a, a prayer request, actually. Um, 
And here it is. It's kind of tied toward, uh, tied with, uh, to, to what Forrest mentioned a minute ago about the way that we do idolize certain things. Um, and I, I want to mention this. There's another danger that we really haven't mentioned today that it has been touched on. We're all in danger of idolizing uh, safety and security and comfort. Uh, and here's the prayer request. Uh, let's all pray in general for the church of Christ um, that we would take on and believe and accept uh, that we follow Christ who told us to take up a cross and be willing to follow him even until death. Um, and that the church of Christ today would truly believe the words of Romans 8.18, that the sufferings of this life are not even worthy of being compared. You can't even put them in the same scale. <laughs> that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. They, they don't even go in the same scale. They're not worthy of being, be, even being put next to each other. Um, and I think we could all pray that the Lord would stir in all of us as his church uh, true faith in those words, um, and that through those words and the other words that we've heard today, uh, he, would, he would really help us answer, yes, that, that risk is worth it because Christ is worth it. Um, and it will be for his glory. So thank you very much for being here today. Trust the Lord will give you a good day. And um, if he would allow it, we'll see you on April 22nd uh, for the final roundtable of season three. God bless you. Have a great day.